Thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. You know, Joy is right. <laughs> this is one of those days. Sometimes, you know, some nights, everything just happens all at once. And when that happens, it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's impossible to absorb everything all at once. And in circumstances like these, the only way to understand the importance of what has just happened in today's news is to not get overwhelmed by it, to not try to get it all at once. Instead, you just do it piece by piece. You do it one step at a time. So that's what we're going to do tonight because a whole bunch of interrelated stories have just had really important developments this afternoon and tonight. We're going to go through it piece by piece. We're going to start in federal court in the Southern District of New York right before Christmas, in mid-December, this past December. That's the day that the president's longtime personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, was sentenced to three years in federal prison. It was a dramatic day. He wept in court. His family wept. Cohen and his defense team and his family all clearly thought he was going to get a much lighter sentence in recognition of his cooperation with prosecutors from the special counsel's office. And for their part, Robert Mueller, the special counsel, and the prosecutors in his office, they did recommend to the judge sentencing Michael Cohen that Cohen should be treated leniently because Cohen had been so helpful to them in, his, uh, in the special counsel investigation, in Cohen's cooperation with them. But the prosecutors from the special counsel's office were not the only prosecutors involved in the Cohen case. And they were not the only prosecutors making their case to the judge that day. There were also prosecutors from the Southern District of New York. Those were the prosecutors who obtained guilty pleadings from Michael Cohen on a whole bunch of felonies. And those prosecutors from the Southern District of New York told the judge sentencing Michael Cohen that Cohen really should do serious time. And so he's going to do three years. He's about to start that three-year prison sentence a month from today. But on the day he was sentenced, back in mid-December, that exact same day, within about an hour or so of when we learned that Michael Cohen was going to do that serious time, that same day we also got, surprise, a whole new thing that we weren't expecting from those prosecutors in the Southern District of New York. That day that Michael Cohen got sentenced, we also got this from the federal prosecutor's office in the Southern District of New York. It is a non-prosecution agreement that those prosecutors entered into with an entity called AMI, American Media Incorporated. They're publishers of the supermarket tabloid National Enquirer. And that non-prosecution agreement with, AP, with AMI, it was unsealed, it was made available to the public, basically upon Michael Cohen being sentenced for his crimes. But it's interesting, you can see from the date on it that it had actually been entered into several months before. We learned about it that day in mid-December when Cohen was getting sentenced, but the date on it is September 20th. It had been in force since the fall, since September. And you remember, of course, what Michael Cohen pled guilty to and what he was sentenced to prison for, right? This whole big long list of felonies, tax evasion, bank fraud, all these things related to his personal business interests, his own real estate transactions, something weird about him selling an expensive purse, which I never totally understood. Uh, there was uh, his business work on this sort of shady side of the taxi medallion industry. Most of the felonies, numerically, pertain to all that kind of stuff. Michael Cohen's business life. But then there were those two felonies that Michael Cohen pled to that were really the real headline, right, that had huge political resonance ever since. The two campaign finance felonies that he pled to. And those felony campaign finance charges were the ones that derived not from his personal business life. They derived from him paying about a quarter million dollars in hush money to these two women who were otherwise going to go public ahead of the presidential election in 2016 with their allegations that they had had extramarital affairs with then-candidate Donald Trump. Prosecutors' descriptions of those crimes and Cohen's own allocution in court about those crimes made clear that he wasn't the only one involved in the commission of those crimes. Prosecutors and Cohen himself made clear that the president himself was implicated in those felonies. Cohen himself said that Trump had directed him to commit those felonies. And the president was described as individual one in the charging documents, spelling out the commission of those crimes. What was also clear in those charging documents about those felonies is that there was yet another party to those campaign finance felonies besides Cohen and President Trump. Another party that played a knowing role in that transaction. But like individual one, like the president, that entity was also not prosecuted. 
right? So in the description of that crime, we get the description of a number of people being involved in the commission of that felony. Cohen ends up getting prosecuted for it. He's going to prison for it in a month. Individual one, the president, does not get prosecuted for that felony, despite his alleged role in it. And that may be in part because he's the president and there's legal ambiguity as to whether or not the president can be indicted for anything while he is still serving as president. But the other party that didn't get prosecuted for its role in that felony transaction was AMI, the publisher of the National Enquirer. And we learned that day in December, the day that Cohen got sentenced, we learned that day that AMI wasn't prosecuted for their role in that crime because they entered into an overt non-prosecution agreement with the federal prosecutors in New York who nailed Cohen for that crime and who designated the president as individual one. In that non-prosecution agreement, prosecutors committed that they wouldn't prosecute AMI for its role in those crimes or for crimes related to those felonies. And they would agree not to prosecute AMI, essentially as a reward for AMI cooperating, for AMI helping prosecutors in their inquiries into that matter. Now, that surprise revelation about that non-prosecution agreement that prosecutors had entered into with AMI, it also bolstered some reporting we had got last summer from the New York Times. Last summer, the New York Times had reported that the CEO of American Media, the president's longtime friend, David Pecker, had himself personally done some sort of immunity deal with prosecutors in exchange for his own cooperation in their investigations. That seemed to be borne out when we got to see that non-prosecution agreement unveiled by the court in December. Now, as I said, Sometimes, uh, like nights like this, sometimes everything happens all at once. So we've got that background, right? We know about, we, we've, we've all absorbed all that stuff about Cohen, that crime, the implication that the president was involved in it, the implication that AMI was involved in it, the fact that AMI had a deal so they wouldn't get prosecuted for it. That all happened before tonight. But tonight, a lot of the things initially raised by that set of circumstances now seem to be coming to a head. First of all, there's the question of the ultimate dispensation of Michael Cohen. He is going to prison in a month. There is ongoing wrangling over whether, over the course of the next month, before he goes to prison, he will testify to Congress. We can surmise that there is something important going on with his case and his role in the larger Russia investigation because of that wrangling. Because the House Intelligence Committee announced yesterday that Michael Cohen's planned testimony tomorrow is being delayed, quote, in the interests of the investigation. And they won't say what exactly they mean by that, but they did go ahead and reschedule him to testify February 28th. By deduction, we can tell that means they think something's going to happen between now and February 28th, something that needs to be done and out of the way before they take Michael Cohen's testimony at the Intelligence Committee. We don't know what that, is, what that thing is. What's going to happen between now and February 28th, that'll make it possible for him to testify, but presumably we just have to wait and see tick tock. There is also further evidence today that something else is going on with Michael Cohen and his case and his case's connection to the larger Russia investigation. Because today we got this court ruling from a federal judge in New York. This is a judge who is considering legal action by a bunch of media outlets who have been trying to make public a whole bunch of material related to the Cohen case. These media organizations want search warrants and law enforcement and David, law enforcement affidavits and other materials related to the Michael Cohen case. They want that stuff unsealed and made available to the public, just in the public interest. So this judge today was considering that request from media organizations. And the judge ruled that, in fact, some of the material that had pre has previously been sealed in Cohen's case, it can be unsealed. It will be unsealed. It'll be released to the public and shortly. Namely, what we should expect to be unsealed is the stuff about Cohen's tax fraud and bank fraud and the taxi medallion business stuff and, and, and other stuff that didn't get the lion's share of attention when Michael Cohen first pled guilty. But when it comes to the really high profile stuff he pled to, when it comes to those felonies that Cohen pled to that purportedly involve the president, that purportedly involve AMI, those hush money payments to benefit the president's campaign, those campaign finance felonies, the judge today said, actually, those materials can't be unredacted and can't be shown to the public anytime soon because those are still live legal issues that pertain to ongoing investigations. So here's a little bit from the judge's ruling where he just, he, he just lays it out bluntly. Quote, 
this court concludes that disclosure of materials with redactions, strikes, and appro- excuse me. This court concludes that disclosure of materials with redactions strikes an appropriate balance between the strong presumption of public access to search warrant materials and the countervailing interests identified by the government. In particular, the government represents that aspects of its investigation remain ongoing, including those pertaining to or arising from Cohen's campaign finance crimes. Indeed, the search warrant applications and affidavits catalog an assortment of uncharged individuals and detail their involvement in communications and transactions connected to the campaign finance charges to which Cohen pled guilty. According to the government's ex parte submissions, these individuals include those cooperating with the government, those who have provided information to the government, and other subjects of the investigation. At this stage, Wholesale disclosure of the materials would reveal the scope and direction of the government's ongoing investigation. It would also unveil subjects of the investigation and the potential conduct under scrutiny. The disclosure of such information may enable uncharged individuals to coordinate or tailor their testimony and interactions with the government. And, the judge says, if the past is any prologue, unmasking those who are cooperating with the government's investigation or who have otherwise provided information to the government could deter further cooperation with the investigation by subjecting those individuals to witness tampering, harassment, or retaliation. Accordingly, the judge says, the portions of the materials related to Cohen's campaign finance crimes shall be redacted. Ruling today from a federal judge. So Michael Cohen's bank fraud, tax fraud, the expensive purse thing, fine. That can all come out. That'll all come out. But the stuff about the hush money payments to benefit the president, the stuff that involved the president's campaign and the president's business and AMI, all this stuff, no, 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 no. That stays redacted because that's a live issue. And there are witnesses and subjects of the investigation and cooperators that cannot safely have that stuff disclosed to the public at least when it comes to the safety and integrity of that ongoing investigation, that live legal issue. So that stuff won't be unsealed anytime soon. And remember, that's the live legal issue. I mean, those are the charges as described by prosecutors and as described by Michael Cohen in court. Those are the charges that implicate the president directly as the person who benefited from that illegal scheme and who allegedly directed it. The Trump organization also appears to be implicated as the entity that effectively laundered those illegal contributions. And this company, AMI, is also implicated as participating in the hush money scheme. Right? It's their gigantic, illegal corporate contribution to the Trump campaign. Their help with this hush money plan. And they skated and they didn't get in trouble for it because they entered into a non-prosecution agreement. I mean, remember, AMI's involvement here, as described by prosecutors, is that they effectively, during the campaign, entered into a deal with Donald Trump that they would contribute to his campaign as a corporation. They would help him politically and materially by making adverse stories go away. They would expend resources as a corporation that would never be declared as campaign contributions, but they would nevertheless be expended in order to benefit Trump's campaign and the hopes of his eventual election by paying off or otherwise disappearing material that might hurt Trump's political chances. In the non-prosecution agreement that AMI entered into with prosecutors, we learned AMI is told explicitly by prosecutors in the Southern District of New York that they won't be prosecuted for their role in the campaign finance felony scheme that Cohen's going to prison for. They won't be prosecuted for their role in it as long as AMI, quote, truthfully and completely discloses all information with respect to the activities of itself and its officers. Those activities as they pertain to the company itself, its officers, agents, and employees. AMI pledges to cooperate fully with the Southern District of New York and any other law enforcement agency designated by that office. AMI agrees to provide all records. They agree to turn up at all meetings. (laughs) And it's kind of a throwaway line at the end, but AMI also in that agreement commits for a period of three years to, quote, commit no crimes whatsoever. Oh, quote, it is understood that Should AMI commit any crime subsequent to the date of signing this agreement, or should the government determine that AMI or its representatives have knowingly given false, incomplete, or misleading testimony or information, or should AMI otherwise violate any provision of this agreement, 
AMI shall therefore, ahem, be subject to prosecution for any federal criminal violation of which this office has knowledge. Oh, the agreement goes on to say that if AMI commits crimes, any crimes after signing this agreement, any statement made by AMI or by any of its representatives to prosecutors or to any other law enforcement agents or at any grand jury proceedings, any such statement, quote, shall be admissible in evidence in any criminal proceeding brought against AMI. Think about the situation that AMI is in right now. They had to come completely clean with federal prosecutors about their role in those campaign finance felonies during the 2016 election in order to get this non-prosecution agreement. I mean, at least one other dude is going to go do serious federal prison time because of his role in that crime. Their role in the crime, mm -mm, they're okay because they got this agreement. They had to come totally clean about their involvement in that crime in order to get the agreement. But for a period of three years, if they violate this agreement by, say, jaywalking, or removing the tag from a mattress, or, I don't know, continuing to engage in a criminal extortion scheme designed to silence people who might hurt the president politically, I mean, any crime, any crime at all, then everything AMI and all of its officers and employees have said is fair game and admissible for their prosecution on anything, including the crimes they have already fulsomely confessed to. And so now, here we are tonight when everything is coming together, when everything is happening all at once. This is a man you will recognize. His name is Jeff Bezos. He is the founder of Amazon. He is one of the richest men on earth. Actually, today we checked. Today, technically, he is the richest man on the face of the earth. He's also the owner of one of the greatest newspapers on the face of the earth, the Washington Post. The president has made no secret of the fact that he does not like the Washington Post. He does not like the way the Washington Post and its reporters cover him and his administration. He has also been remarkably unsubtle in connecting his complaints about the journalism of the Washington Post to Jeff Bezos personally and to his concurrent ownership role of both the Washington Post and Amazon. In May of last year, for example, you might remember, we learned that the president had personally personally, individually, directed the Postmaster General of the United States that the post office should financially stick it to Amazon, that they should hurt the company, and by extension, Jeff Bezos' personal bottom line, by doubling the postal rates that the U.S. Post Office charges Amazon to ship its packages. The president personally giving that directive to the Postmaster General in order to hurt Amazon, in order to hurt Jeff Bezos, in order to hurt the Washington Post. I mean, that itself would be the single biggest scandal in most modern presidencies, right, for any other president. I mean, for this president, that was like, you know, an average Friday morning, maybe it'll make the front page kind of thing. But like, honestly. Uh, but again, there has been no subtlety about the president's antipathy for the Washington Post, his personal antipathy for Jeff Bezos because he's the owner of the Post. It's, it's all quite out in the open. Well, last month, the National Enquirer, the flagship publication of AMI, they published private, intimate text messages that were exchanged between Jeff Bezos and a woman with whom he was romantically involved. Mr. Bezos and his wife of 25 years, upon that publication of that story, then announced the dissolution of their marriage and their impending divorce. And the president reacted to all of that with glee. The president said publicly, quote, so sorry to hear the news about Jeff bozo being taken down by a competitor whose reporting, I understand, is far more accurate than the reporting in his newspaper, the Amazon Washington Post. Hopefully the paper will soon be placed in better and more responsible hands. So it's the president delighting in Mr. Bezos' divorce from his wife of 25 years, um, delighting in the role of the National Enquirer and bringing that about and saying out loud that he should lose the paper. The Washington Post shouldn't be in his hands. Look what the National Enquirer turned up about him. Uh, before long, there were signs that uh, perhaps this story existed on more than one level at once. Uh, a report that Bezos himself had launched a private investigation into what was behind this National Enquirer story, what was behind their publication of his private text messages. Yesterday, the Washington Post had this headline, 
Was tabloid expose of Bezos' affair just juicy gossip or a political hit job? If it was a political hit job, one pot potential implication of that kind would be that it was perhaps carried out by AMI to help President Trump politically, once again, by hurting or trying to take out of the equation somebody who Trump perceives to be doing him political harm. I will tell you there's also a Saudi Arabia component to this <laughs> with the National Enquirer, which is a related but separate angle. We will get to that in a different part of tonight's show. Um, but now, tonight, this is, this is how this all came together. Uh, Mr. Bezos, Mr. Bezos tonight published this 10-page post online, and it is titled, as you can see, No Thank You, Mr. Pecker. Mr. Pecker, in this case, is not an insult to somebody. It's the name of the CEO of American Media, David Pecker, longtime friend of President Trump. No thank you, Mr. Pecker. In this post tonight, Mr. Bezos publishes what he says uh, is the full, unredacted, recent correspondence he has had with the National Enquirer, with Pecker's company, AMI, which he describes as a, quote, extortion and blackmail effort. Now, we should note that NBC has not independently reviewed these emails. We're going off what Mr. Bezos has published, but here we go. Quote, Rather than capitulate to extortion and blackmail, I have decided to publish exactly what they sent me, despite the personal cost and embarrassment they have threatened. Bezos says, quote, a few weeks ago, when intimate text messages from me were published in the National Enquirer, I engaged investigators to learn how those texts were obtained and to determine the motives for the many unusual actions taken by the Enquirer. As it turns out, there are now several independent investigations looking into this matter. Quote, several days ago, an AMI leader advised us, meaning him and his lawyers and this guy who he's hired to lead an investigation for him, uh, several days ago, an AMI leader advised us that Mr. Pecker, David Pecker, the CEO of American Media, is, quote, apoplectic about our investigation. Quote, a few days after hearing about Mr. Pecker's apoplexy, we were approached verbally at first with an offer. They said they had more of my text messages and photos that they would publish if we did not stop our investigation. I guess we, me, my lawyers, the investigator we hired, did not react to the generalized threat with enough fear. So then they sent this. And then Bezos publishes what he says is the full letter that he received this week from AMI, describing in graphic detail 10 different personal and embarrassing photos that the Enquirer has obtained and is threatening to publish in order to hurt Jeff Bezos. Quote, with the Washington Post poised to publish unsubstantiated rumors of the National Enquirer's initial report, I wanted to describe to you the photos obtained during our news gathering. AMI, according to Bezos, then goes on to demand that Bezos affirmatively say publicly that he, quote, has no knowledge or basis for suggesting that AMI's coverage was politically motivated or influenced by political forces. And unless Bezos says that, they will publish these embarrassing photos of him that they have obtained. So like I said, everything happens at once, right? But the bottom line here is that Jeff Bezos, the richest man on the face of the earth, the guy who owns the Washington Post, he has just blown this up by publishing what he says is this extortionate, threatening, blackmailing, panic button stuff from the National Enquirer and AMI. Don't you say that what we're doing is politically motivated. Don't you say that this has any political intention. Don't you say that we did this for any reason other than just embarrassing you, don't you say that this comes from a political place or we will drop this nuclear bomb on you. Whoa, why? I mean, I should tell you that AMI declined to comment tonight since Mr. Bezos has made public what he says is their correspondence. But there's questions here, right? Why is AMI freaking out like this? Why are they going nuclear against Jeff Bezos now? I mean, they've already exposed his affair. They've already set, set his divorce in motion. They've already caused him all this pain and embarrassment. The president has already danced on his divorce, right? I mean, specifically, they appear to be quite panicked about him turning up any evidence and making any credible allegation that they may have acted, once again, with political intentions. And we know, because we follow the news, that when AMI panics like that, about that, we know they're doing so in the context of their still active non-prosecution agreement with the Southern District of New York. It is still in force. AMI's obligations under that continue until a period of three years from the signing of that agreement, which would be the fall of 2021, 
or the date on which all prosecutions arising out of the conduct described in the agreement are final, whichever is later. <laughs> So at least the fall of 2021. And frankly, when it comes to whether all the prosecutions are final, we know from a judge today ruling on the Michael Cohen case that it sounds like all the prosecutions might not be over when it comes to those campaign finance felonies that AMI is implicated in, that they have been fulsomely <laughs> open with prosecutors about already under the protective umbrella of a non-prosecution agreement. They are currently benefiting from this non-prosecution agreement as long as they're still holding to it. So the, the wheels do appear to be coming off here a little bit. One of the parties to the two felonies in which federal prosecutors have implicated the president may have just violated the terms of their non-prosecution agreement. While the judge today let slip the fact that the prosecution of those felonies is an ongoing law enforcement matter. And by the way, the acting attorney general who the president appointed <laughs> to oversee the Mueller investigation, <laughs> who ignored ethics advice that told him he had to recuse from overseeing that investigation, he's going to appear in Congress tomorrow to answer questions in open session. And the Saudi Arabia part of this just blew up too. And, and, and some nights everything happens all at once, but you get through it one step at a time. Stay with us, more to get to. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.